Great. Well, uh, this is uh, a great pleasure to be here. It's uh, about six, uh, five and some minutes here in the afternoon in uh, South Korea. So welcome to colleagues around the world. Uh, my goal is to talk some about the history of graphene as well as uh, current and perhaps future directions for the research. And I very much appreciate the invitation from Peter and team to, to talk to all of you uh, today. Let's see, I guess this will be good. Oh no, I don't want that. I want a pointer. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So first of all, uh, happy Chinese New Year, or we say in South Korea, happy Salal. So we're currently in the middle of uh, starting our four day holiday. And uh, this of course is my joke slide that some of you have seen, but if not everyone, I hope it brings a smile to your face. Let me give a very brief introduction to UNIST and the IBS, and then I'll, I'll segue actually into the history and then talk about some other topics. So our university is about 10 years old. We're located about right there in South Korea. And uh, the university is the fourth Institute of Science and Technology in South Korea. You probably have heard of KAIST. And then there's also GIST in Gwangju and DGIST in Daegu, and now UNIST in Ulsan. Just a moment, Rod. Uh, yep. Somebody is writing. Okay, so that apparently there are a few people who cannot see the slides. All right, please continue. Uh, okay. I hope you can see the slides, and uh, this is an aerial view of our, our university. Now the Institute for Basic Science, we have about 30 centers located through Korea. And uh, they are in math, physics, chemistry, life sciences, earth science, interdisciplinary. So the, the goal of the IBS is something akin to the Max Planck Institute, but we have our own style. It's to really embed long-term basic science in the Korean culture. So let me start, if I may, with this uh, image of scaled production of graphene. This is uh, Professor Halfei Shi kindly uh, gave me permission also to show you what is on the next slide. So this was a recent publication from his group. And how did we get here? Uh, and of course, there are a number of uh, enterprises around the world uh, that are growing graphene at this sort of scale, but these are 30 by 24 centimeter graphene sheets. There's roughly 40 of them packed into a large oven. And in 15 minutes, uh, CBD graphene can coat both sides of the copper foils and they can slide this tray over and then insert another into the oven after a brief purge and grow again. So, my disclaimer, uh, there isn't any way, I don't think, in an hour to give uh, a really thorough coverage of everything about graphene CBD. So uh, I'm sure I'll overlook lots of beautiful studies. And for that, I ask your forgiveness. But uh, we hope to make up for that by citing review articles. Peter has explained uh, that later we can distribute my talk to everyone uh, and and thus all of these will be readily available for you to see. And uh, I guess if at some time in the future, as Peter mentioned over many, many beers, uh, it would be really fun to talk and talk and talk about CBD graphene with any or all of you. So we identified these reviews as uh, relevant to CBD growth of graphene. There are probably some other very good ones as well. And uh, I sort of cobbled together my talk because Peter asked me about uh, roughly a week ago, would I be able to present? And I said, sure. And so uh, we have slides numbered 14 through 73 in case you have questions. Those are without gray shading. 
And uh, those are what I refer to as pre-2014, because in 2014, I moved to South Korea, a sort of a, a jump in my timeline. And then we returned to slide seven. So if you have questions, just say gray number or without gray. Thank you. So uh, how is graphene defined? It's interesting that uh, the Britannica mentions that the term graphene was introduced, as you see, by Peter Bohm and colleagues uh, in 1986. I think before that, there had been active discussions at Carbon International meetings and even, I think, some discussions in the journal Carbon. And uh, this is from the Britannica. And then this is the definition by IUPAC of what graphene is. Actually, the definition came in part from graphite intercalation compound studies. And so uh, it's interesting that I think monolayer graphite that I'm going to turn to next is perhaps deserving uh, to be uh, mentioned in Britannica and in terms of the history. So let's visit some of the early surface science studies to gain some context of what had been done uh, before our work, for example, on growing on copper. So there were actually four very interesting studies by Samarjai's group at Berkeley in which they were dosing hot uh, metal single crystal foils with different crystal orientations. So we appreciate this is the brilliant UHV surface science type studies. So these single crystals are relatively small but adequate for example, for low energy electron diffraction studies and so on. And what the Samurai group uh, reported, uh, they did not assign a structure, but they did very nice science. And as a consequence of their reporting these sorts of changes in the lead patterns, theoretician John May, who was a world leading expert in lead, uh, came to look at those papers and published this paper in surface science discussing monolayer graphite and some of the lead patterns fitting misoriented multilayer graphene. So I uh, published uh, this article in the MRS bulletin that you might find interesting sort of perspectives and talks about some other interesting structures as well. But in this perspective, I mentioned that uh, John May uh, referred to this as monolayer graphite and then also assigned stacked graphene layers, we would say now, uh, that were misoriented. So I mentioned a sort of a back to the future success because we'd love to be able to control misorientation these days and not only have AB stacked. Okay, I'm stuck for some reason. There we go. We come to the beautiful work by Jack Blakely and his group at Cornell University. There were a series of papers that uh, Jack Blakely published with his team and they used single crystal nickel, which they would uh, dose with carbon to differing extents. And what Blakely and his team found out uh, was something very interesting. We use the term segregation, which is different than precipitation. And what Blakely's team found, and I won't have time to go into detail here, but if you can imagine that the concentration of the carbon in the single crystal nickel could be varied, the driving force in a particular temperature range in, term of in terms of thermodynamics was uh, therefore influenced. So the higher concentration of carbon would lead to a stable formation of a segregated monolayer at high temperature. And then when the system was cooled, uh, as you cool slowly, you are then supersaturated at each temperature with respect to carbon and time permitting, 
uh, based on the size of the crystal, where the carbon atoms are in the lattice, and uh, the rate at which you're cooling, uh, those atoms can come to the surface and precipitate to make a multilayer graphene or a graphitic layer. So, uh, as I mentioned, I won't, I won't go into great detail, but this was uh, is, and is very interesting. You can actually have graphene forming as a monolayer per what they saw with low energy electron diffraction and uh, uh, also in situ OJ. Okay, so I'll jump forward through all of this fascinating work by Jack Blakely's group that also extended to platinum, palladium, and cobalt. And so they saw this sort of segregation behavior on each types of uh, crystal, uh, some of which are uh, epitaxial matches to graphene and, and some of which are not. So uh, the lattice matching is an interesting issue. Then there's uh, Oshima in Japan, who had a number of very beautiful studies of quote, monolayer graphite, what we now would call uh, graphene and really delved into structure. And this was one very interesting result in which through their studies, they were able to understand that uh, on nickel, for example, such as nickel 111, we have a different situation than on some of the other uh, types of materials like copper, as I'll, I'll come to later. So this is referred to as chemisorption, although I think it's still actually an exciting question of whether covalent bonds are actually forming between the nickel and graphene. Uh, then we wouldn't call it graphene per se. So, but in any case, the interlayer separation is significantly different than, for example, on copper or platinum, uh, in which the interlayer separation is of the order of about 3.3 to 3.4 angstroms. I'm sorry that the slides are changed, uh, sort of, it's a large file. There we go. Then there was a very nice work out of the University of Zurich, uh, Jörg Osterwalder and Thomas Graeber. Uh, you might be familiar with their uh, history of working with hexagonal boron nitride. So in 99, they published this very nice paper about growth on nickel 111. And I encourage looking at their literature because uh, there's some very nice discussions about the critical role that by our standards, we might say very small concentrations of impurities can make in the structure of the film that is grown. So for example, uh, 13 learned that by constantly uh, annealing and then re-annealing to remove any residual carbon that might be in the nickel, it was then possible to grow HBN as a continuous film. But if they had small amounts of carbon, they actually would end up with uh, the situation where islands grow that are incompatible. The nitrogen terminated edges are facing nitrogen terminated edges and boron terminated edges are facing boron terminated edges on neighboring islands. And so uh, they were careful to note that that was a speculation on their part, but they did correlate with removing as best they could all of the carbon present in the nickel. And then they were able to get a, a continuous film and also growing the mesh material uh, on rhodium that has this very interesting uh, sort of uh, pattern that's referred to as a mesh. So I just mention uh, this because we're interested in historical context. And so uh, I, I'm taking a jump away from CBD graphene, but just to briefly mention some of the older literature also on uh, manipulating layered uh, crystals to get individual layers and make physics type measurements on them. So we had patterned uh, graphite through uh, lithography and oxygen plasma etching and then rubbed them to create multilayer graphene platelets. Uh, a quick rub, for example, with a silicon wafer will cause these to delaminate in this manner here. And 
I see, I have a little bit of a problem, but uh, I encourage one to take a look at, uh, for example, the work by Robert Frint. So this extends all the way back to 1966. So they were able by sort of scotch tape method, except scotch tape might not exist, so they called it the cellophane tape, to uh, peel off individual layers or close to individual layers and make very interesting measurements on them. So uh, one of the uh, things we uh, did do, and I'll come to Xu Song Li and uh, his many contributions in our group with Luigi Colombo and these, this slide and the following slides, is we embarked uh, at the University of Texas on efforts to grow on metal foils. So now we're taking a jump to a quite different system than the surface scientists use, a relatively simple tube furnace uh, into which we're operating at uh, moderate pressures up to ambient or a few atmosphere pressure or low pressure, meaning uh, not UHV conditions or even medium high vacuum conditions. So this gap between uh, the surface science conditions and the way we try to scale growth of graphene introduces all sorts of interesting scientific issues and challenges. Uh, let me just make a few remarks uh, about this slide because this is you know, 12 years ago. And so one interesting thing in retrospect is that we, we uh, exposed the heated copper foil when heating to about 1,050 degrees Celsius to hydrogen gas for about an hour we now know that this is way longer than necessary, but there might have been some advantages as we since have learned, and I'll come to later, about the role that hydrogen can play in removing residual carbon that is typically in these copper foils as a consequence of how they are manufactured. For example, uh, the oxide layer can be moved by a quick dip removed by a quick dip into acetic acid. And so uh, that uh, work by Dennis Hess's group, I'm sorry, I don't have the reference right in front of me, um, can eliminate the oxide layer entirely within a second or two, and then you can uh, clean, uh, blow under nitrogen, and then insert and probably expose to hydrogen for only a very short time. But we were trying to find our way. We chose methane because our interest was to grow at high temperature close to the stability of copper, which would be at its melting point. And we were just guessing that that could be very important. Uh, often high temperature growth leads to higher crystal quality. Of course, the CBD system can be used with many, many different sorts of precursors. And that's where the community, of course, has contributed is in many studies of a wide variety of uh, precursors for growing graphene. We also needed to uh, transfer the graphene to substrates, and that's still an active topic of research today, how to do that well. This is Shusong and uh, Luigi. Uh, we we're a very close team. Uh, my conversations with Luigi were seemed to be almost on a daily basis. He was working at Texas Instruments at the time as a Texas Instruments fellow and had uh, the ability because of TI's interest to come and work with people in universities also. So, Shusung began his efforts as a postdoc, first working on carbon nanotubes in my group, and then we, we switched to studying graphene. And he spent about six months working on nickel foils. And then after challenges with the nickel foils uh, that I'll mention in the next slide, uh, we switched to copper. And after only about a month of using the copper foils, including because of all of his experience in working with the nickel foils, he came in with a smile on his face and said, I see tiny wrinkles on the copper foil and SEM. And so one should appreciate, we didn't really know what to look for to see 
if we had graphene or not. And then once you know, then so many things become obvious. So if we had truncated growth where we didn't grow a complete film, beneath the graphene islands, uh, the copper steps would be evident in the SEM images. So they weren't yet oxidized. That was another uh, way of realizing, oh, we have graphene there. Uh, in between the islands, we wouldn't see those sorts of steps. And then we went ahead and did Raman and, and so on. So the difference between nickel and copper, uh, and critical, factor is the solubility of carbon in nickel versus in copper. So at about a thousand degrees C, the solubility of carbon in nickel, the thermodynamic solubility is roughly one atomic percent. In copper, it's parts per million. So uh, this ended up uh, being very important for us. And you know, I think is one of the reasons why uh, growth on copper has been so useful. So for example, uh, and this would be typical to the results we were also getting, uh, it's very difficult to control the situation of uh, growth on nickel, although great progress has been made sort of revisiting what Blakely did, such as by Stefan Hoffman's group and, and others. Uh, at that time in 2009, we felt that copper was very valuable because it, it eliminated this issue of having variation in the number of layers over short distances where we could get mostly monolayer over relatively large distances with some add layers present. So we began to attempt to automate certain aspects and this, uh, is hardly a high level of sophistication, but it was very valuable for us to do this around 2009, 2010, to have much finer control. Most of what Shusong had been doing up to that point was through manual control of the parameters. So a small percentage of ad layer, uh, and interestingly, we found that copper was a very sort of forgiving surface in the sense that we could see that uh, islands would continue to grow uh, both across the copper surface steps and even uh, an island with a single orientation, what I call a grain here, uh, sometimes could grow across, excuse me, the islands could grow across the grain boundaries in the uh, copper surface. And many other people have seen this as well. That's a very interesting aspect because a typical situation with nickel is on the different nickel grains in polycrystalline nickel, and here we're using polycrystalline copper foils, uh, the different nickel grains will have different orientations. And that is influenced by perhaps the stronger interaction of the growing graphene layers, at least the first one with the nickel. And we uh, worked extensively on improving transfer and measured things like transparent electrodes. Uh, one method of doing transfer is to coat with a polymer, like PMMA, and to completely dissolve away the uh, underlying copper foil and to then pick that uh, layer up from the water etchant air interface and transfer it onto, for example, a silicon wafer with a moderately thick oxide layer, such as 300 nanometers thick. <clears throat> and then many measurements can be done uh, on that insulating oxide layer, various types of spectroscopy like Raman, and then also configuring electrical devices and making measurements. This was also uh, placing onto a, a flexible substrate and showing that the resistance uh, stayed essentially constant over many bending cycles. Another thing we did that has proven to be very, very valuable was we began to change the methane from normal methane to C13 methane. So we uh, had a nice arrangement, which we still appreciate with Cambridge Isotope Labs, for about a two year period, they provided us C13 methane uh, 
at, uh, at no cost for our research. And then through using that C13 methane, we were able to really learn a lot about how the graphene was growing on the surface because we are controlling the timing of the input of the C13 labeled methane compared to the normal methane. And then uh, we can look at what happened by this color-coded map, which is color-coded because the different regions are showing different frequencies of either the 12 labeled graphene or the C13 labeled graphene. And so you can see in the first cycle for only one minute, we grew these islands that were moderately large. And then we have a little bit of C12, which is the black in this one. And then we completed growth. And so this teaches about the kinetics of growth. Uh, and so this was a very uh, useful uh, step toward uh, understanding how graphene grows and progresses on these sorts of copper foils, for example. So uh, one thing we, we further studied was uh, growth on nickel uh, versus growth on graphene. And briefly on nickel, uh, there's a role in terms of diffusion into the nickel under the conditions we were using. And that led to this somewhat uncontrolled uh, number of layers as a function of position on the surface of the nickel. But with copper, we could uh, demonstrate from the isotopic labeling that in fact, the growth was monolayer only and then self-terminating under our conditions. We wouldn't grow additional layers. <clears throat> we then varied, uh, Shusong varied many, many, many conditions to try to understand the growth on these polycrystalline copper foils. A tremendous amount of work here uh, as we were trying to sort of feel our way. And in these days we were working, uh, you know, at, a variety of different pressures as well. Again, through the isotope labeling, it was possible for our team to get larger and larger domains. We might also refer to those as grains or islands that eventually would join to uh, generate a certain density of grain boundaries. So, we understood, and this is something that Luigi and Shisong and I would talk extensively about, would there be ways of controlling the nucleation so that we could minimize the presence of grain boundaries and try to grow larger and larger grains or even single crystal? So if you have a very high nucleation density on a polycrystalline copper foil, as we learned, it would then lead to a high density of grain boundaries. It since has been learned uh, recently uh, through work from Wen Sei Rai uh, and colleagues uh, in China that uh, these very, very small grain graphenes and driving it all the way, for example, to amorphous graphene, such as was done at uh, National University of Singapore, uh, is a very exciting topic unto itself. But at that time, we were interested in trying to get larger and larger grains and trying to approach single crystal graphene. So one of the ways uh, that we chose to try to do that uh, was to ask ourselves, what are the actual mechanisms of growth? And, you know, I think an enormous amount of work has been done on this and I'm not doing an adequate job of delving into the various beautiful theoretical modeling studies and other experimental work. Uh, and so I think deeper understanding of uh, the actual growth uh, precursors versus the gas that's uh, introduced into the CVD systems is, is still an active area of research, but a lot of progress has been made. So one thing uh, that we did, uh, which was kind of interesting, is we grew in copper pockets. It's actually Shusong did this first, and I'm jumping over some of his work. But uh, later, when uh, using the, uh, these copper pockets, uh, 
So the way we, we do this is we fold the copper foil over and then crimp the edges. Uh, and so there's a very small gap where some methane and hydrogen can get inside this pocket. Uh, and most of it, of course, is on the outside. And so the CVD conditions inside the so-called pocket are different than we could achieve uh, without using the pocket. And actually that influence the nucleation rate and also the growth and size of the islands that we ultimately saw. So for example, this is one example uh, from Shisong's work where it was possible to, at that time, get quite large single crystal islands on the copper foil. This is on the inside of the enclosure. On the outside, we'd have much smaller grains present as per the typical Veron with the flat piece of copper foil. We then began to explore, and uh, I think Luigi made uh, very strong contributions here as he did to all of the studies. And we, we had a lot of conversations with Yufeng Hao and our colleagues about what could be the benefits of controlling an additional reagent, which would be adding a little bit of oxygen. We uh, operated with uh, oxygen-free copper foils that we purchased. And then we also studied the normal copper foils and then deliberately, deliberately also added oxygen as an additional reagent. So make a long story short, uh, Yufeng uh, transitioned to Jim Hohn's group at Columbia University after I moved to Korea. And fortunately, we could continue our studies. And some of the work was with Pocket and some with Hout, but we ended up indeed learning that the role of oxygen could be very, very valuable in knocking down the nucleation density so that the islands could grow to be of the order of centimeter in size. These are some of the uh, roles that oxygen can play in terms of uh, blocking nucleation because of passivation of uh, much of the copper foil. This is again, uh, the use of the C13 labeling and our ability to map kinetics, but also to better understand some of the structures that are appearing with or without oxygen. We actually learned that the growth was faster in the presence of oxygen uh, of those regions that nucleated and could sustain growth, uh, just that the nucleation rate was much, much lower. So uh, we uh, collaborated with colleagues who, uh, and others who have looked at, uh, you know, what the mechanisms could be and what the roles of oxygen could be. So main conclusion that was uh, reached by these colleagues in terms of their modeling was that oxygen helps to reduce the edge attachment barrier. Another thing we did is we collaborated with colleagues who joined in to do phase field simulation. And the phase field simulations could actually uh, match well and help to rationalize the sorts of structures we were seeing. Now, another very important effort with uh, Yufeng and also extending to Columbia University efforts in growing there after uh, working in our system at UT Austin was to deliberately attempt to grow bilayer graphene and see if we could get fairly large bilayer islands. So what's happening here is we have a lower density of methane and hydrogen inside the pocket. As a consequence, the nucleation density on the inside surfaces is very, very low. And that leads to uh, not coating the inside surface with the monolayer that would then block further dissociation because the catalytic copper surface at that point is completely coated by graphene. 
So imagine, if you will, that growth on the outside surfaces happens fairly quickly and we get a continuous film. And in fact, that's what happens. But on the inside, that hasn't happened. And so some of the dissociated uh, species on the inside can diffuse through the foil and they can actually build up at the interface between the outer copper surface and the continuous single layer graphene. And that diffusion driven mechanism, it's a short distance to diffuse through and uh, maybe easier in some cases for the, copper at the carbon atoms to do that than to surface diffuse. And so that would often happen. We found conditions under which a bilayer graphene could be grown as a consequence of an add layer growing on the outside surface underneath the existing single layer. So the lighter regions are single layer and the darker regions are bilayer in these SEM images. So we ended up uh, uh, through collaboration with Kevin McCarty and low energy electron uh, microscopy and diffraction having a method of showing that the, uh, the add layer growth was definitely happening at the interface and not somehow a top. And so it was possible to unequivocally or sort of unambiguously show that. So how does the second layer grow? I've, I've sort of already explained that. <laughs> so I got a little bit ahead of myself. <clears throat> So we need to have diffusion through the copper foil to grow the add layer. And we'll revisit this a little bit later when we look at work uh, that we've done in South Korea to get very large bilayer regions. So this was some of the modeling that uh, we did to try to rationalize what was happening in terms of our bilayer growth. I won't go into any special detail here. So ultimately we could get to, at this time, uh, this was quite significant. We could grow larger than a millimeter, for example, of bilayer. And it turned out that it was AB stacked. So evidently uh, in the regions where it would grow well, there was uh, recognition, so to speak, the carbon atoms that are coming through of the orientation of the single layer graphene above. And often we found, because our uh, experiments would run for a long time at relatively high temperature and in, uh, with hydrogen present, that the outer surface would have converted in significant regions to the 111 uh, copper uh, crystal orientation. And I'll revisit this a little bit later in the talk. So uh, the Columbia group made measurements uh, why we had questions about why wasn't it 100% AB stacked. I think those questions persist. And we did isotope labeling again. And we could find that sometimes a grain boundary would be present in the first layer and that would trigger uh, a different orientation for the under underlying layer. So I'm going to uh, move a bit rapidly through these measurements, but what was important at the time was that we had demonstrated we had very high quality AB bilayer. And uh, some of you might be aware, but many of you might not be aware that it had already been demonstrated through the scotch tape experiments that AB stacked bilayer, if you have a, an electric field vertical or perpendicular to that bilayer uh, in a device configuration, it introduces a band gap and thus there are opportunities for making devices from bilayer graphene that are AB stacked. And uh, the measurements show that the quality of the AB stack graphene grown by this particular, not exactly chemical vapor deposition only method, but based on bulk diffusion through the pocket led to high quality AB stack bilayer. Uh, we then sort of scaled up, but 
I've already indicated people around the world and particularly at companies have scaled up significantly further. We worked on uh, transfer uh, also, and this is sort of an ongoing effort, not only for us, but, but many groups. Uh, and this was Jiwan Suk, uh, a student in my group, uh, working with some of our team members, and uh, Bennett Goldberg and Anna Swan from Boston University uh, joined in on interrogating the quality of the graphene through Raman and other methods. One thing uh, I became very interested in was uh, I ended up uh, learning that there are copper nickel alloy foils that are commercially available in very large scale. And they're called copper nickel 9010, 8020, 7030. They have, for example, 90% copper and 10% nickel and frankly, some other elements in the commercial foils. And those are used because of their oxidation resistance in uh, shipbuilding and in a variety of other applications. So one thing that uh, Shan Shan Chan and our other coworkers here, and it's a very nice collaboration with Ji Wong Park did, was we looked into the oxidation resistance of graphene coated copper and copper nickel alloy. And therefore in the copper nickel alloy, we could grow uh, multi-layer graphene and then in coated copper, uh, the single layer graphene. So this is an example of an American penny that was coated on one side and not the other. And the graphene coating confers oxidation resistance. <clears throat> Actually, the way this came about is a good example of the benefit, like Peter mentioned, of our giving talks and getting good questions. I was giving a talk at Cornell University when Ji Wong was a professor there. Now he's at University of Chicago. And I said, you know, we see this impressive oxidation resistance. And he asked me after the talk, but have you guys studied that in detail? <laughs> and then I said, well, maybe we should look into the science of that in, in further detail. And so Shan Shan and uh, Lola actually had a lot of discussion, worked closely together, and then uh, we, we delved into whether it could actually work as a protective coating. And uh, there's been a lot of studies since then by people asking that question, how many layers do you need? What if there are pinholes or not, et cetera? It, it remains a very interesting research topic. Just, I'm gonna to touch briefly and quickly on a, a few things we could do as a consequence of growing these large area graphenes on, on copper. And so one thing we could undertake uh, in collaboration with Li Shi was a Raman study of thermal conductivity. And uh, this was a consequence of uh, Alex Belandon's group uh, and their earlier efforts on measuring uh, thermal conductivity and showing that Raman, a non-contact method, could actually be useful in extracting thermal conductivity. I won't go into details, but what we did here is uh, uh, we made uh, isotopically labeled graphene and we showed that the isotopic labeling, the percentage of the minority component, if it's C13 pure, the fraction of C12, or if it's C12 pure, the fraction of C13, uh, greatly influences the thermal conductivity when suspended in this membrane configuration. We were actually fortunate that some of the membranes didn't survive because in this measurement, we slide the graphene in and we measure the power absorbed through that membrane and the ability to quickly slide in uh, a position in the multi-hole grid where there wasn't graphene and measure the actual power uh, on a short time scale when there was no drift in the uh, Raman system was quite important. So is it quite interesting, perhaps not too surprising, that when you uh, really have isotopically pure graphene, 
as is known to be true for diamond uh, and to some degree for graphite as well, you have a tremendous increase in thermal conductivity. So for example, the room temperature thermal conductivity of diamond that is C12 pure or C13 pure is about 50% higher than the normal uh, isotopic abundance of 98.9 and 1.1. So there's a very dramatic increase for thermal conductivity at room temperature. But then it, it turns out as you increase the temperature, they begin to uh, look like they're going to coalesce the curves. So in this uh, discussion of uh, or presentation to you of uh, at least some of our work uh, before 2014, I'd really like to thank uh, the members of my own group. And I'm sorry, the problem with the slides, I don't quite understand this, uh, but uh, I listed, a, and I'll fix this for what, I, what we send out to all of you later, all of my UT Austin colleagues as well, uh, and show you the, some of the uh, people who were in our team in addition to Shusong and who worked often in close discussions with Luigi as well. So I finish this by uh, sort of tossing in a slide because I do remember this comment very, uh, very, very uh, poignantly uh, where I was having lunch. I went out for lunch with John and we walked over to a restaurant near the building that we shared and uh, you know, during the course of the discussion, this was probably around 2010 or 2011, he said this, and it, it kind of stuck with me. So it's, it's a nice uh, quote to perhaps think about. Okay, now we come back to so 2014 onward, and uh, let me check my time here. Just a moment. I see, so I need to move along. <laughs> Very quickly, we in, uh, you know, when I came to Korea, we, we obtained conversion of polycrystalline copper foils to single crystal metal foils. And I'll move through this quickly. Uh, this is typical polycrystalline metal foil. We can see such uh, grains present as a, uh, a variety of methods such as electron backscatter diffraction. So this is a fun uh, poem by H.D. Block, a, a Crystal's Lamont, where he talks about the exciting things that can happen in polycrystalline materials. And uh, I'll just read the first paragraph, but he says, I am a little crystal in a polycrystal sea. There are many other crystals and they're pretty much like me. I don't have much to do with most except quite distantly. But some of us get together at the old grain boundary, at the old grain boundary. And so I showed this poem to Sung Wan uh, and said, let us eliminate all grain boundaries. <laughs> so he achieved that. And uh, we ended up with very large uh, foils that were single crystal throughout, including in plane orientation. And when you grow graphene on such large area single crystal foils, nucleation and island growth occurs so that the islands are aligned. And a lot of effort has shown that the islands then join essentially seamlessly almost all the time. We did this with uh, nickel foil and cobalt foils as well, and platinum and palladium. And so coming back to how this benefited us, uh, that allowed us to place nickel onto the copper 111, controlling the nickel concentration. And by doing that, uh, we could then grow monolayer much, much faster than on pure copper 111 because of the catalytic activity of nickel. But at a higher nickel concentration, we could grow very large area bilayer. So what we did, uh, Ming would take our copper 111 foils dip into a nickel electroplating solution. He would monitor the current, telling him how much copper he had electroplated, weighing the copper foil before and after matched the calculated amount of copper that was deposited. So we can control to three significant figures, the atomic 
concentration of nickel in the copper through this method. After deposition, it's important to then anneal, and by annealing, we could then end up with uh, copper nickel foils that could grow CVD graphene extremely well and very rapidly. These Raman spectra and also Raman maps are common ways for graphene researchers to know the quality of their graphene. So that's been sort of become a kind of a gold standard, if you will, for understanding what you have in hand. Now, if we bump the nickel concentration up to, for example, around 20%, then it was possible through a, a detailed parametric study by Ming to have multi-centimeter regions with 95% of the film being AB stacked bilayer graphene. And so the ability to grow uh, the bilayers significantly improved. And uh, this was published in Nature Nanotechnology and the maps are again showing very high quality. This allowed us to transform that bilayer graphene into F-diamine. And this was a very interesting story from my perspective because I had been thinking about this for about seven or eight years. So I was really interested in figuring out a method to get to large area AB bilayer that could then perhaps allow us to tackle uh, achieving this uh, diamine structure. And Pavel Bakharov played a very central role in planning how to do this once we had the AB bilayer graphene. We chose fluorination from Pavel's suggestion. So we do this by reacting with xenon difluoride and don't have time to go into all of the details, but uh, Pavel's choice of fluorination versus hydrogenation was not random. He knew that the XPS, the X-ray photoelectron spectra in the C1S region, the CF bond can be distinguished from the CC bond and the CH bond cannot be distinguished from the CC bond. So XPS uh, was really central to Pavel's hunt for generating proper stoichiometry that might be the diamine. This is sort of showing uh, from calculations how bonding between a diamine and a metal substrate can happen. And it was Chernozatonsky and colleagues, uh, as far as I'm aware, who were the first to discuss diamine through their theory and modeling. And uh, I think they coined the term diamine as well. And so theory in this case preceded experiment and the first experimental observation and proof of generating diamine was done with fluorine instead of hydrogen. I won't have time to go into all the details. Uh, and I just wanna mention competing C2F uh, structures are shown here. And we were able to show through our detailed work, including cross-section TEM, that it's actually this structure that could be formed. And so I'll show you now cross-section TEM. And on our copper nickel 111 foil, uh, these are really beautiful uh, images obtained by Sakwu Li in Zheng Hun Li's group at UNIST. And this is the bilayer graphene. And then after fluorination, long story short, the CC average interlayer difference, distance, excuse me, the average value at any one spot, it might vary a bit per our ability to assign it through TEM, but the average was 2.06 and the interplanar separation in diamond is 2.06. So there was no doubt from the cross-sectional TEM, but also from XPS that I won't have time to go into in such detail that we, we do in fact uh, have this diamine. So this is a nice example of why we're interested in growing graphene and also in multi-layer in terms of being able to make entirely new materials. So I'm, I'm unfortunately gonna have to run through a lot of the beautiful story about the XPS that Pavel developed and modeling from our colleagues.
Uh, and I'd like to uh, jump ahead just for a moment. This, well, these are really incredible images of this F-diamine that exactly match uh, what would be expected for it uh, in terms of TEM. But I'd like to wrap up by talking about uh, a couple of further goals and then coming to a brief discussion of what might we face in the future. So in terms of uh, growing a single layer uh, graphene on copper 111. We found that there's compressive strain present. We delved into that and ultimately published this paper in advanced materials showing that indeed the graphene we grow on copper 111, except for the few regions where it de-adheres, uh, is under compressive strain due to the thermal contraction of the copper foil between the high temperature that we grow at and when we cool it back to room temperature. So the copper contracts that places the interface under compression and when it's epitaxial, the copper will adhere pretty well and therefore it is found to be under compressive strain because of shifts in the G band and 2D band that had been previously mapped out by our colleagues at POSTEC. <coughs> So we could learn, for example, that we have epitaxial growth and then maybe one out of 100,000 islands, the rest would be single crystals. Uh, Dalo and our group get a rust estimate, rough estimate from a sort of statistical survey. We'd see an oddball and where there was another grain present where they had joined, very unusual situation in here, we'd see wrinkles, but not here. So this story about wrinkling and why it de-adheres when we don't have epitaxy, but it doesn't when we do have epitaxy, was well treated by theoretician colleague and group leader in our center, Feng Ding. And so they came up with a very nice model in terms of the energy landscape for forming wrinkle uh, when you're in epitaxy versus when you're misoriented on the copper surface. I'm going to jump over chemistry. Uh, it's fascinating. The compressive strain can drive certain chemical reactions. But I'd like to jump to this topic quickly because we discovered what causes the 5% add layers or the few percent. And what causes it, to make a long story short, is in copper foil that we buy from the commercial vendors, when they manufacture it, they pound some carbon in through the hot oils that are present on the rollers during the foil making process. Rod, and, Rod you, should, uh, you should probably think about wrapping up. Okay, I'll wrap up in a minute or two. And so- Sounds good. Yep, thanks Peter. So it turns out that that copper uh, foil as received, which is polycrystalline, and then we, when we convert it, we heat it for about 12 hours at around 1,000 degrees C in hydrogen. We noticed when we would grow graphene on our copper 111 foil, we didn't have any add layers. So we actually did a, a study to try to understand why in the polycrystalline foil as received, do we always get some add layers? And we learned that it's from this carbon that's present in the copper foils and can be removed by for example, long temperature annealing in hydrogen, the carbon that is in the copper foil diffuses to the surface, reacts with hydrogen, and it's ultimately completely removed. So uh, I'll jump over that work, but I, 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 I just wanna show you one slide, uh, which is we don't have perfect graphene. <laughs> From our standards, we have single crystal everywhere. We have no add layers. We have essentially no wrinkles, but we have these beautiful long folds. And that has become a topic of interest for our group. Those folds are where deadhesion happens. They always run orthogonal to steps that are present in the single crystal copper 111 foils. And we haven't found a way to eliminate them, 
but we've recently submitted a paper where we have fold free, and I can't go into those details here, but uh, it is now possible to achieve single layer, large area growth on foils that is fold free, add layer free, wrinkle free, and so single crystal over large area and epitaxial. Let me jump to uh, some discussion of, uh, oh, didn't add it, oh my goodness. I'm so sorry, I'm missing a slide. Okay, let me just talk out loud then. We'll insert the slide when we send it to you later. But I think the future challenges are, uh, my first question would be, what do you think the first future challenges, all of you who are listening, if any of you are growers or interested in doing that, uh, you probably have exciting goals. For me, future challenges include growth of uh, perfect bilayer over many, many square centimeters, perfect trilayer, perfect n layer, uh, and I think those will probably be AB and ABA and ABAB stacked at the outset, and then ultimately controlling. Uh, the misorientation between the layers to make an entirely new type of material differing from crystalline graphite, for example. Uh, other exciting opportunities are with pick and place because I think those capabilities are growing rapidly around the world. And so if we can eventually get to centimeter scale and pick and uh, stack uh, with good interfaces, those offer or afford many possibilities for making graphene-based materials as well. So those are just a few of the topics that are on our mind. Uh, I'm sure there are many, many other directions for the growth of graphene in the future. So thank you very much. <laughs>